Good morning, everyone. If you're in Australia or good evening, if you're somewhere else in the world, we're um, shortly about to start this session, part of World Localization Day. So just as people trickle in, make yourselves comfortable, settle in. It should be a really great discussion with some amazing panelists, some panelists this morning. The session is called the ism, localism, the ism to end all ism. So what we're going to be talking about is where do the most potent solutions to our global crises come from? So the panel are going to talk about, um, well, they're going to unravel widely held assumptions that underpin our global monoculture. We're also going to touch on this paradox around how does localization offer a trajectory for change while simultaneously allowing global or diverse viewpoints and diverse cultures in our global system. So I'm really excited to hear from our panelists today. I can see a few people are trickling through and starting to uh, put some messages in through the chat. So now's probably a good time for me to go through our tech instructions. So everyone, as you're coming through and setting, settling in, um, Please, if you have any questions, feel free to, as the session goes on, type them in the Q&A. You'll see the Q&A is different than the chat. So the little Q&A section down in the bottom right of your Zoom screen, we'll be looking at questions and fielding those potentially towards the end of the session. Um, if you want to chat, if you want to discuss topics, discuss um, or even just call out how much Tyson is a legend, or any other thing that's happening in the chat there, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, also, you know, feel free to acknowledge where you are and the country you're on and, and the, um, the traditional custodians of the land that you're on. I'd like to start by doing that and acknowledging uh, where I am. I'm on Bundjalung country in Northern New South Wales. I know our other panelists, Helena is also on Bundjalung country and Tyson and, and Trudy are on different parts of Australia as well, but I'd also like to acknowledge First Nations people all around the world as we have people dialing in and coming in this session from all over the world. So please feel free to let us know where you are and what country you're on. I'm gonna give a quick intro to each of the speakers, each of our panelists, and then they're each going to give us a, a presentation, which I'm really excited about. So first of all, Sorry, tech troubles. Um, okay, so first of all, of course, we have Tyson Yunker Porter. Tyson is a member of the Appalachian clan in far northwestern Queensland. He's an academic, an arts critic, and a research researcher, and author of Sand Talk: How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. And it's a, an unbelievable book that has spurred so many amazing conversations. And I'm really excited to hear from Tyson today. We also on the call, we have Trudy Juriance. Trudy is a key contributor in bridging communities and organizations in Asia and Oce Oceania, activating collaboration across borders and disciplines and often being the catalyst for various projects and initiatives. She's an accredited trainer in GEN, or the Global Eco Village Network, uh, Gaia Education in Eco Village Design Education and Analog Forestry in Forest Ecosystem Restoration. And of course, we have Helena Norberg Hodge, the, co the founder of Local Futures and convener of this World Localization Day that we are uh, part of today. Helena is an author. She's the author of Ancient Futures, Learning from Ladakh and Local is Our Future. She's also the producer of the Economics of Happiness. She's a recipient of the Right Livelihood Award and is also, which is also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize and the Goy Peace Prize for her pioneering work towards a new economy. Um, welcome all three of you, Helena, Trudy, Tyson. Beautiful to be Thank with you. you this morning. And so I think, I think Trudy that's was enough to... for me. Uh, I'm gonna let you guys. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I think we'll let you guys jump straight into it. So Trudy, if we can start with you. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Helena. No, yeah. I was just going to say that. that I think I've got an answer. True. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, yes, Trudy, go ahead. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Helena. Thanks, James. 
And uh, yeah, great to be here with you all today. I'm happy to be here with you too, Tyson. Good to meet you. Um, yeah, I'm from GEN, which is the Global Equivalence Network. I've been working with GEN for the past nine to 10 years. I'm back in Australia for the last two years. I've, I'm from Sri Lanka originally. So my, um, I'm a bit of a global citizen, but very connected with the local places and the communities that I've been with over the past um, 10 to 15 years or so. And what I'm really interested in, you know, like with, when Helena, when you asked me to, to be part of this panel, you know, and with this, this word localism and how do we really connect, how do we decentralize, how do we work more with the local systems um, for change? I've really been able to see so many solutions, you know, in, in such small ways that have big ripple out effects in the communities that I've been part of um, in Asia, mostly in Asia, and now getting to know a lot of the communities in Australia as well. Um, and what I think is really important when we talk about localism or decentralization, it's how do we take the power back into our own hands? You know, how do we really look at local solutions? How do we reconnect with, with who we are? You know, and I think what I've really learned from traditional and indigenous communities over the years is really a big, a lot of, a lot of these communities are losing their culture. You know, and because of globalization, because of this like mammoth, you know, this modernism and, and being almost pushed to come into this global mainstream um, system. Um, but, but a lot of them still hold very strong threads to their culture, you know, very strong threads to their social systems. And, and I, I see them actually as some of the, the world's first eco villages, you know, because for thousands of years, they really were living sustainably. In, in connection to the land, in connection to all of their resources that they were able to manage um, and take care of, you know, so deeply. Um, so what I've really been able to see with these communities is that they've been able to, and I'm just gonna just pause for a second because I'm, I'm, there's, a, there's a vehicle in the background there. I'm actually in, in um, North Queensland and traveling back to Brisbane, just actually coming from a, a community that we've just worked with for the past week. Um, but you, what I see eco villages do, and these are the traditional indigenous communities as well as intentional communities that are part of our network, that they're really calling us to remember who we are. You know, what do we have? What do we, what do we need to do? How do we use what we have, our culture, the threads of our culture, the threads of our social systems to, to really reconnect and to solve problems locally, to address big problems, global, global problems like climate change, deforestation, but how do we really address them locally within the power and sphere of influence that we have? So we have this um, framework, the Ecovillage framework, um, which helps us to do design. It's a process. We see Ecovillage as a process. It's not, not an outcome, you know, because it, it takes time, you know, and um, we have this framework that really looks at these four areas of regeneration. We have the social, culture, economy, ecology, and then whole systems design in this in the center that helps to really connect and gives us the how to. So um, I would love to share a few examples from some of the communities that I've visited. Um, and, and one of them uh, in India, you know, which is, you, uh, we all know India as a, as a really big um, global, um, really a product of, of globalization, you know, and you see a lot of these communities really struggling. One of the communities, and it's a network of communities in, in Orissa, that have really been able to um, really come back and preserve their culture. We see a lot of the, the women of these communities that are really stepping into power and are the leaders of the communities. And one of the organizations that works with these um, network, this network of it's over 2000 indigenous communities, um, really helping to strengthen local capacity, you know, helping to strengthen the local uh, the capacity of these women to really like, um, to, for example, to do organic agriculture. To, to have local governance, to have to, to really form key decision, have key decision making bodies within their villages. Um, and we had the opportunity to visit one of the villages and one of my students who, who, went, who, who visited was just so amazed by um, what he saw, the food that he ate, the buildings that the, the natural buildings, the houses that they lived in and said, you know, what, what's in this food? You know, he asked the women and the women were like, well, it's, they just laughed and they said, it's love. You know, like it's this food was grown with our hands and it was grown from from our heart. So it was just he was just amazed that the simplicity of their life, but how they were able to combine their indigenous knowledge with with appropriate technology. You know, um, 
some other examples from our from our network I'd love to share as well. Um, and I'll, I'll go from India to China because we, these are the two big countries that we see in our world that are really like rising up. Um, and China, we have um, an Eco Village um, network as well, Sunshine Eco Village um, network. And part of that ne network is a community that's um, not so far from Hangzhou, which is a really big city um, near Shanghai. And they've really also realized, okay, we're losing our culture, we're losing our language. How do we come back? How do we come back to simple way of living? How do we um, really come back to like the, the old forms of agriculture? And what we see in China is that a lot of the villages in China have been abandoned, where young people, families have just been leaving and going to the city. And what this community is saying is, let's come back to, to the village. You know, there are these, this, these um, villages that have all this infrastructure that are just empty, you know, and how do we come back to that? How do we um, come back to the ecological farming that we used to do? How do we bring, come, bring our culture back? Um, and what I really like about this community is that they also practice like meditation um, in all of their community meetings. They start with a simple way of attuning with each other and just reconnecting, you know, and being in place. And they're calling, you know, they have a lot of a big flow of young people from the city that's coming to this community um, and um, and learning, you know, and, and understanding that, okay, we're part of this global system that's going really fast. Um, with materialism, overconsumption, and it's time to really just come back to being um, in a very simple way of um, living. And I just want to check my time and just please call call out to me if I've gone over, James. No, you're okay, Trudy. Yeah, great. Um, and just going into like another example, um, uh, another community that's actually part of um, Oroville. So Oroville is in Tamil Nadu in the south of India. Um, and it's, it's about 3,000 people. Um, and actually this group of people came to Oroville about 50 years ago and they found um, the land just completely um, desertified. It was de deforested. The trees had been cut down through colonization and shipped back to Europe. And the people that came and settled were like, okay, we need to, we need to fix this. We need to start to rehabilitate the ecosystem here. And they settled and they started planting trees, you know, and it's a really great, it's, I think it's a very successful example of how they were able, really able to rehabilitate the local ecology, you know, to the point where they have restored um, the, the, the watershed, um, the water levels have, have risen, there's a microclimate in this, com in, in, in Oroville. Um, and then one of the projects actually, that's one of my favorite projects is Pichandi Kulam Forest. You know, it's about 65 acres where they've able, really able to restore the ecosystem so planting probably over 800 species of different plants and trees but then also opening it up to the local communities and creating like an arts educational and um, uh, ecological center um, and I think what's really interesting is that they have been able to support the the local communities and the government has also seen what they have been doing and have reached out to them and said hey can you help us can you also um, uh, help us to create educational institutes that can help us to um, support um, local learning. So creating like the Sustainable Livelihoods Institute, teaching about these different ways of restoration, about how to create livelihoods so people can stay in place. So people don't have to go off to the cities, you know, and go find um, other thing, uh, uh, places to work. Um, and another really successful example of Pichandikulam is working again with the government to restore a landfill in Chennai. You know, and if you've been ever been to Chennai, it's it's a it's a busy, hustling, bustling, quite a dirty, intense city. You know, but they've been able to do this work of restoration really in place. You know, so learning from what they've what they've been able to practice, and then also being able to teach others. You know, so these examples are like, um, I guess, to just to give an idea of how like when you're when you're really practicing in place how how you can also ripple that out you know and um how creating local enterprise local governance systems can really sort of um, help to change you know further out so i'll stop there and maybe pass on to back to you james yeah thank thanks trudy so just quickly we've had a we've just had a really quick question in the chat here what what's the name of the organization in orissa that you referred to um, it's thread and I can type it into the chat, which is an acronym and I will. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we've got one of the one of the um, listeners who's working with the team in sounds like in that region who's curious. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Just before we throw to to the, our next panelist, and we will have some time for discussion and and um, field some questions after. But Trudy, while we've got you, I'd love to ask you a question. So those beautiful examples of how these eco villages and these networks have created outcomes in different areas, like. How there's that paradox which we have create these local global scale essentially the global that GEN is trying to be a kind of a global organization right that is then um, creating these localized approaches is there a bit of a, a paradox there between how do you how do you approach localism or localization <laughs> mm-hmm. from a global point of view yeah, that's a really good question, you know, because and I think that's where the power is, you know, the, the power is there with the communities on the ground that are the living laboratories of of creating something alternative. OK, the mainstream is not working. How do we bring the power back and decentralize? So you've got these communities that are like hubs across the world. You know, we're reaching out to the, like over 6000 communities in every every continent. And then you have these different le- levels of, of connection. You've got these national networks so the at the country level where the communities can connect within their own country. Country. And then from the country level, they connect at the, at the regional level. So you've got these regional kind of networks that basically also are able to like grab, gather the stories, are able to spread and disseminate, you know, the solutions, you know, and then it goes to the global and the international where the regions can connect with each other. And so there's a lot of cross collaboration happening, you know, between these networks. Um, and I think this is where the cross pollination happens as well. So when we have a solution, you know, we, we need to share it, we need to spread it. Okay, something hasn't worked for us. How do we get those insights and those lessons out there so that we can keep learning from each other? And, you know, so we can keep, and what I always, I say, um, or, and I've learned this from one of my teachers is, how do we continue to to stand on the shoulders of those that come before us, you know, like our ancestors, like building from what they have learned and, you know, and, and not trying to reinvent the wheel as well, you know, so we don't have to keep using up so much energy. Let's, let's come together and, and let's share and learn and, and keep growing, you know, in, in a positive way, in a way that has a low impact on the earth and doesn't cause more mass destruction. Mm. And if people want to find out more about Global Eco Village Network and your work and what the organization does, where can they go? You can go to ecovillage.org is our global site and each of the regions you'll be able to find the regional networks um, websites also there as well. Um, And we have also a national network here in Australia and I think that's also an interesting network to connect with because we have um, quite a number of intentional communities here in Australia, as well as all the many Indigenous communities, you know, the, the First Nations people of Australia that we have much to learn from, you know, and I'm also very excited to hear from Tyson um, as well and um, connecting with that. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Judy. And that's a perfect segue. Yeah, you're exactly right. Because uh, we also on the on the chat today, we have Tyson Yonkel Porter. Tyson, good morning. Welcome. Thanks for joining hey. us today. How are you doing? I'm, I'm coming today from uh, Bunurong yeah. country in Melbourne there. Um, yeah, and I can I can carry on there and, and, and speak to that, uh, what you referred to as that paradox. I mean, it's, it's only a paradox in abstract that uh, sort of seems like it's a conflict of opposite things, that local and global you know, um, kind of idea. Um, but really, y- you need it. Um, basically, that's the law of the land. And it, it's and if, if you like, so in our way, it's the law of the land. But if you like, you can think of it in terms of the laws of physics, as well, you know. Um, so, you know, if you look at the first and second laws of thermodynamics, that, that first law, which I like to think of as first people's first law as well you know it's the same thing that first law of thermodynamics is that idea that nothing's created or destroyed but things are recycled you know within and across systems you know things just transform they change form and they come back around um that's a really simplistic way of saying it but that's basically it you know and um 
there needs to be exchange across and between systems so you know your body is a system and there's exchange you know with many other bodies human and non-human and your place and everything else etc um, and one system's entropy is another system's lunch you know so you don't outsource that entropy to somewhere and let it stagnate it's got to uh, you know it's got to feed something else so you know these systems do need to interact um, second law of thermodynamics, I think, informs a lot of people's ideas of eco-villages and even just village life and what it is, that it's parochial and cut off from the rest of the world. But that second law of thermodynamics is, is about enclosures, uh, vacuums, you know, where you try to prevent a system from interacting, you know, with other systems, which is actually impossible. Physicists will tell you there's no such thing as a vacuum. Uh, but the idea is the the more you can limit exchange with other systems, then complexity inside that enclosure will break down really quickly. And that's what they say makes time run forward. <laughs> that's why linear time always goes forward. Um, but according if you if you made built your theory of time on the first law of thermodynamics, then time would look very different. It would look, you know, more like a first people's uh, perspective on time. Um, but you don't have to listen to me for that. You can listen to Charles Darwin. He came up with that idea a lot longer before I did. So, <laughs> so if you don't believe me, you might believe the same guy that gives you your theory of evolution and everything else. So we need that syndication. Um, human communities do need to be mobile. Um, we've been through a lot of apocalypses in Australia and our capacity to be mobile as needed. Um, and to be adaptive, that's what that's what gets you through. And it only works if you have that syndication happening across with different peoples. So throughout it, the, 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 the biggest apocalypse ever has been the invasion of Australia and the eradication of so many of our cultures. Um, but in every case, <clears throat> the law of, that, uh, of any uh, region that's been completely wiped out, um, that law is kept by neighboring regions and even regions quite far away uh, because we've had those song lines and trade routes forever where we're trading with each other along those lines. Um, I think it's, it's a wrong story, this idea of many of the ideas of Paleolithic life being simple and brutal. Um, and even the idea of village life is that it's parochial and people are cut off you know, from the rest of the world and you grow up just seeing the same 150 people and you never know anyone else. Um, that's some weird European medieval sort of fantasy <laughs> that didn't even exist in medieval Europe. You know, there's always been trade, exchange, alliances, embassies, you know, um, with multiple regional groups everywhere. And in your bioregion, you know, it has a spirit. It is sentient. You know, it, it's a system of systems, you know, your bioregion, and it has a spirit and it is sentient and self-organizing and you are of that place, but that place doesn't just float in space. It's not an island. It's connected to other systems. Your pattern for being is modeled on your region. And necessarily, if your pattern on your region, then you're interacting with other regions and you need to be able to do that. Because Trudy, you know, it's all very well having an eco village in China, but they will want to build a ghost city there. <laughs> because, you know, there's bureaucrats who want to get promoted and they have to be building, you know, so they have to displace all of the villages in that place. And then um, those people are then put to work strip the sweeping the streets forever and keeping that place clean, that dead, empty city. They're not allowed to live there. They have to travel in from whatever camp they're placed in at the outskirts, you know. Now, if they're syndicated with other villages across other regions, they can then migrate to there. And, you know, those villages have to figure out how to accept refugees from other villages that get destroyed. Because from my community's history, I can tell you there is a, um, a pattern for that, uh, for how nation builders destroy the local. Um, and that's what we're up against. And it's not just national at the national level, it's at the global level. And what they do is they break down, the first thing they break down is those networks. So, you know, they had to make sure in Australia that they cut off our trade with Asia and with Melanesia. They had to cut off that trade to make sure they isolated us as a continent. 
then they had to break up the trade that was happening all around Australia, uh, where people would travel for a thousand miles to um, well, for ceremony and trade, etc. So they had to destroy that syndicated economy. Then they could focus on these entropic little local groups then, and that's easy to break down. So in my community's case, it was only at the start of last century that happened, and it's very easy. You don't even need many people to do it. You just have to abduct a critical mass of women and hold them in one place. Um, um, then all the other female relatives of those women will need to come in uh, to make sure, sure they're all right, and then you keep them there. And then um, most of the men will have to come in too because, you know, uh, men can't procreate. So we then have to come in. And so then you build your mission out of that, you know. Um, and, you, you know, you always get about half the men saying, no, we'll, we'll stay out here living. And, and they, yep, they enjoy a good 50 years and then they're dead. Um, so that's how you do it. It's pretty easy to get it started. Um, my community had that for about 50 years and then were, you know, became empowered and local, you know, <laughs> everybody else had been taken over. So we weren't syndicated with the other regions, but we became empowered and local and, um, you know, our lands have been devastated. So, um, um, so basically my community started a corporation, uh, that was, uh, selling, uh, beef cattle. You know, um, so we were able to run cattle for about 30 years and, and survive very well and still maintain all of our traditions and all of the rest and out of control of the missions. And we dodged control of the government as well until about 1980 um, when the government uh, came in and took over the community, um, um, enforced compel compulsory welfare on everybody. So. We weren't allowed to make our own money anymore. There had to be welfare coming in. They declared a brucellosis scare, not for any of the white pastoral companies all the way around, uh, but just for that region. They declared a brucellosis scare and shot every cow, all of the cattle uh, from a helicopter uh, to break up that business. And um, yeah, then put everybody into a tiny village on a grid pattern. Um, so, you know, 13 different languages all together in one place, which is never a good recipe. And so then, you know, alcoholism, violence. Um, yeah. And today that neoliberal pattern just keeps squeezing it tighter and tighter and tighter so that you can never go out into the bush uh, to do your foraging or to have any kind of food sovereignty. You can't go out for very long because you have to report into the office every few days. Um, otherwise, you get cut off. And after you get cut off, it's usually not long before you get some kind of fine that you can't pay. And then you go to jail for non-payment of fines. Um, so they, they get you, they get you and you have to be syndicated. So what we have in my community is, is quite a mobile community. So I've got half my family is spread across half of Queensland and uh, quite a few people right the way through Australia. Um, you have a bit of a, dia a mobile diaspora, you know, so people are in, uh, go to all different communities, you know, um, and you might not see them for years, but, you know, <laughs> it comes back around. And, uh, yeah, you have to be syndicated. You know, if you're not syndicated, then you're not anti-fragile and you won't survive what's coming. And, and what's coming is, is pretty severe. It's pretty massive. You know, particularly with um, they're going to have to be ramping up horrendously over the next 10 years, even more the extraction um, that's needed. I'm just hoping China cuts us off, uh, finds a way to cut Australia off as soon as possible. <laughs> They've been trying to do it for years, um, come to a point where they can, they're no longer dependent on us for resources, um, you know, so that they can have their own sort of sovereignty and can sort of flick us off their back like a little flea. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm hoping that hoping that happens sooner rather than later, um, because otherwise the next ten years looks very very bad um, for all of our empowered local communities all over Australia. Um, every single one of them is going to get fracked, and it doesn't matter if you don't agree to it because they can drill sideways <laughs> and frack underneath you anyway. Everyone's going to get fracked, extracted, strip mined. 
everything else. And, you know, our elders are going to be destroyed. Our children are going to be destroyed and taken. Um, but right now, there are more Aboriginal children taken from Aboriginal families in Australia um, than at any other time in Australia's history. You know, um, it's, it's really ramping up. <clears throat> it's really awful. We have more deaths in custody than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. Um, and it must be that way because those minerals must be extracted. It's the only thing that keeps Australia's economy going. And without it, the entire thing would fall apart. Um, so they will be murdering us a lot over the next couple of decades. And to do the extraction that they're going to do anyway, that's going to kill everybody else on the planet as well. So we do need to be syndicated. Um, localism doesn't work unless it's also quite global. Isn't that right, Helena? It is absolutely right and why we've organized World Localization Day. And I do, well, should I launch into my little presentation now? Please do. I was going to say, yeah. who needs a moderator when you guys are segueing <laughs> to one another? I'll just step out. <laughs> no, we love you and need you. But I might as well answer that question and, and say also that Tyson through that local collaboration that we've been engaged in for 45 years, our picture is also a little bit different in that it's not just Australia that's going to die. It's China, it's Sweden, it's America. We're talking about a global system where we must start looking at the role of global corporations and banks in pushing every government. And unfortunately, most national governments are more than willing the revolving door between national governments and these global corporations, unfortunately, is swinging all the time. So I think it's quite helpful to hear your very um, dire warning, Tyson. I do believe that our work in studying this global phenomenon of this global extractive economy and what it's doing worldwide in terms of poisoning water and air, driving up emissions, all the time using more resources and replacing more people. So it's destroying the human right for any kind of meaningful productive work. It's destroying our right to care for each other, to care for the land. We have become too expensive for ourselves because we're floating in a system where the dollar, you know, which is determining everything, says that we're too expensive and we can buy a highly complicated plastic electronic gadget from China for less money than we pay for a kilo of potatoes. This is a completely um, manipulated economy that's driving us to extinction. So I think we do need to say that, but we also need to say that there is so much more happening in terms of a counter movement than we are aware of. And the, this counter trend has been growing, it, it, I have to say almost from the outset of this global extractive economy. There have been people demonstrating around the world that they want connection. They want to be able to care for their children. They want to be able to care for their grandchildren and for themselves. They want to care for the land. They don't want to poison the water, but it's this extractive machine-like system that we haven't looked at enough. And we, I, today on the last day of World Localization Day, I don't want to dwell too much on that extractive disastrous system, but I do believe that it is very important that we look at the fork in the road and see that we are being pulled. And that's China, Australia, Sweden, I see no exception pulled in the direction of this centralizing, globalizing path, which is a competitive, it's patriarchal, it started with white men who were overtly misogynist, overtly racist, and overtly anti-nature. And actually, you mentioned Darwin. Well, from what I know, Darwin and Adam Smith had exchanges, and their thinking was not in line with indigenous people. Their thinking was not one that understood in the more feminine way the need to embed ourselves in the, in the 
I, I don't want to say systems, I want to say in the richness of life and the complexity of life, they were beginning this path towards the belief that a few men can come up with good ideas for the entire planet. That's a, that was from this outset a, a mistaken idea. And it's now in the form of, again, a few white men wanting to drag us to compete over scarce minerals on Mars. And as another panelist, I think David Corton was pointing out in another webinar, you know, they're, they're going for a planet that's already dead, you know, to just fight over some minerals. And using how much of our resources on earth to do this. On the other side, and I have to say led by women, led by also by now the new leadership among indigenous people who are finally being heard, we are seeing a very important shift, Tyson, towards, towards a respect for the indigenous, for a respect, essentially, well, I, I say essentially the local. I mean, fundamentally, the indigeneity was about that embedded, deep connection to the living world. It was also very importantly, worldwide, people who evolved in deep connection to each other and the way they did that was by maintaining the natural flow of intergenerational connection, the connection between the newborn baby and the hundred year old grandfather. This was also so important in my experiences in Ladakh was to see how men from the age of four or five were caring for the younger, for the siblings, for the young animals, and that nurturing engagement with life is what kept those men in, in balance, balancing their feminine, balancing the hormones to have that nurturing capacity. They were, if they didn't do it, they were also living in connected structures where the grannies and the aunties would pull them into line. So that's a really important part, I think, of understanding indigenous culture and how we evolved. And I was very um, thrilled to recently make the acquaintance of Gabo Mate and to have a, a conversation with him where I, I hadn't realized before just how clear he is about the fact that we evolved that way, that this thing that's going on right now that sounds so big and so nasty and so destructive is a tiny, tiny bleep in our history. It is like a second in a 24 hour journey. Let's not take that second as the be all and end all and as the big system. Let's think of that as a hot air balloon, which has been pumped up with, with lies, with narratives that simply don't conform with reality. We are talking about allowing a few corporations and men to add zeros after their dollars to just pump up and blow up in this completely artificial way. There's no reality to that wealth except the power that we are handing over. I believe that the awareness that needs to spread about localization as, an, as this ism that can end all ism, but also as the ism that can heal the world can punch a hole in that balloon and it could pop very quickly because luckily the way the structures operate, our governments have not yet handed over the armies to those corporations, certainly not directly. So I believe that the awareness, not only that this system is so utterly destructive of our health, of our self-respect, of our loving relationships to one another, one of the worst things it's doing right now is forcing us through techno-economic control to run faster and faster and faster. So we can't even stop to breathe. So here I'm talking quickly, quickly, because in order to analyze and deal with that rapid train of plane or satellite taking us in the wrong direction, uh, we need a certain amount of speeding up our awareness, our energies, to spread the word about that equally. We need to spread the word that from the bottom up, there is a movement 
that has been going on for a long time, but that is accelerating, particularly after COVID. It is, it's so much bigger than we realize. For me, the greatest joy yesterday was to learn that there's a farmer's market in Byron Bay where I live that I didn't know about. I've been going around saying, well, I started the farmer's markets in Byron Bay because I only knew about four big farmer's markets that I had been involved with. I didn't know that there's one that's been there for two years that is loved and is only a half hour drive from where I live. This to me is a truth that I have discovered as I travel also in China. And I've seen that people don't want this. It goes against everything we need and want. And I have to say the movement from the bottom up is led by women. It's very clear and it is, it's not being documented. So we don't see it. You have to go to the grassroots and basically, ideally, you would be traveling. You would travel this globe. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, I ended up doing that because my book did, I got such a strong response from 40 language groups and I was invited to different corners of the world. And I hate traveling actually to this extent, but what has been wonderful about it is finding everywhere evidence that people don't want it and that they are rebuilding the fabric of connection, the connection to the natural world, the place where they live and to each other. And this is what, what localism is all about. It's a deep journey that is happening and it's happening as we speak. There are more people who are saying, enough of this, I'm going to do something that is meaningful and that makes sense. Now, part of that, which hopefully people will have listened to, it's a, now a whole fabric. It includes a lot of the work of the Global Eco Village Network, but it includes the work of Via Campesina, the biggest social movement in the world, 200 million small farmers who have for now 30 years been trying to wake people up to the trade treaties that are the main mechanism that whereby governments are handing over power to a de facto global banking and corporate system that is taking us away from life. And that is, is as Tyson was saying, is killing us. So being so clear and strong about that system doesn't mean that we can stand in judgment of the people inside those corporations. Some of them are actually still well-intentioned, but so utterly misguided. And the movements on the ground do need, we need intellectual leadership, we need the economic literacy to be spelling out clearly how billions of well-intentioned people are supporting a deadly system, a system that's anti-life. We have to go very grassroots and very active and alert to find the information, the counter narrative. And of course the counter narrative is plural. This is the essence of localism is understanding why it is the ism that will end all isms is that it can never be a blueprint to impose on any culture, on any part of the world. The essence is the adaptation to that amazing wealth and complexity of life. Have I gone over my time, James? No, you like, like I feel completely unnecessary. You're bang on. Am I bang Helena. on? All right. I just <laughs> no, no. like to finish then. Am I bang on right no, no. now? It's, it's good. It's good. Unfortunately, you're uh, Helena, it's your any... day. You can take as much time well, as you want. No, no, but I'd like to know because I wasn't keeping an eye on when I started and I'm as no, no. I can go on forever. So don't invite me to do that. Um, but is there any way you can improve your internet in any way? Because you're breaking up quite a lot. Mine. Yeah. I don't know if, oh. if, if is James breaking up for you as well, Trudy? And just, just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It would be good Sorry. if you are able. I don't know if you're able to move nearer the whatever yep. you call it. Um, but so yeah, I just, yeah, I just well, maybe. I'm hot I spotting, want, like truly. Okay. I will just finish up by saying that, um, that there's so much more happening than we can possibly know. And I'm thrilled 
to be aware of how impossible it is to keep track of the, all these amazing localization initiatives. By definition, they are human scale. They are helping people to slow down and connect in a way that allows them to love and care and nurture and allows people to be heard and seen, to become visible, to become respected for who you are not what you look like, not the color of your skin, nor the brand of your car, or the size of your house, or the number of degrees you have, but who you are as a unique human being. That slowing down and that scaling down is allowing that to happen. It's, it's a miracle to me that it is happening inside a system that is so powerfully pulling us in the opposite direction. But this is what also gives me hope that if we can raise our game a bit to start looking at the key policies that we have to demand a change in, and that is what's being taxed, what's being subsidized, what's being regulated, we need to keep our eye on that. Unfortunately, we have no political voices doing that right now, but we can generate those. And I'm not talking about sending in individuals to this system, I'm talking about building up a powerful movement that demands those policy changes. So it's not about working go with government as we do at the moment. Uh, and it's starting a bit from the bottom up. Uh, we can see policy changes that are becoming meaningful. And I just wanna say also uh, give a big strong word for the fact that the most important economic activity we have ever engaged in has been producing food. And producing food is what most of us were involved with in one way or another. Now, as we move forward into the future, <clears throat> we won't be going back to exactly what was there before, but there is no doubt that we need more people, more eyes and hands per acre of land in the forest, on, in the sea, to extract for our needs, for our basic needs. <clears throat> So again, this is what's happening in the localization movement. Um, and this is where, if you study the local food movement, which includes fish trees, which includes um, diversity that also provides for wood and other building materials. So in that movement, you will see more traction, more action than in any other. And it is the central, most important. So it's wonderful that that's happening. And I just quickly want to add that when I talk about slowing down, there have even been some small studies in the localist movement that show that at the farmers markets, people have 10 times more conversations with other people than they do in the supermarket. And again, they have slowed down to actually enjoy a process of buying food, which previously was a bit of a torturous, unpleasant experience that you just wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. There are many other things that I hope we have a chance to discuss because the uh, critique of elitism, the critique that this is just for, you know, a wealthy minority is understandable, but it's so wrongheaded. Um, once you understand that our governments are subsidizing dead food from far away and shipping food across the world back and forth to be processed, you'll understand why the localists local food movement is not elitist. Anyway, there's, there's so much more to celebrate um, than we might um, think. There's so much more to do, uh, but what I'm finding is as people understand the primary need for connection, they change the I to a we and come together to look at what can we do at the local level rather than how am I going to change this massive system, the we turns this into a much more joyous journey immediately, a fun journey, a loving journey, a connecting journey. And that is so energizing and empowering. So I urge people to connect with localism and um, you know, connect with World Localization Day and Local Futures. If you want to do a PhD in localism, come to our website. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. And do you know what? I think um, what you've what you've beautifully articulated there, right at the end, is is touching on 
what a few people are starting to ask in the Q&A. So now we've got some time for you three to have a discussion and ask. feel free to ask each other questions and chime in, but I might start just to lead on and, and dig a bit further because both Howard and Stefan in the Q&A have asked this question that's, to me, I've been pondering as well, which is around, is localization what you're talking about is not about um, trying to look at the big problems and then try to put in a fix because there are these big external problems. Whereas what I've just heard you articulate is something more along the lines of it being a, an expansion of our emotional or, or spiritual even. Really, it's us moving to localization because we want to step out of this paradigm that we're in something doesn't smell right we're not happy about it we're not enjoying this global system that we're in and so really localization is kind of a side effect of our, our own inner work and it's a reflection an external reflection of us moving in that direction rather than kind of rationally being convinced that we need to do this i think it is an intuitive and sort of embodied journey um but I know that it's helped also with um, an intellectual uh, journey where we wake up to a bigger picture that helps us see more clearly why this journey makes such sense. Uh, and, and again, what Tyson was talking about, it's really important that we do see it from a global point of view and that we do come together in what he calls syndi in a syndicated way. Uh, and what it means is that we connect to each other to support each other and to have, you know, a clear message to this concentrated centralized power about the need to decentralize power. Do, hmm. Tyson, do you want to say yeah. something to that? Yeah, well, I, I think that anybody has basically been making a living for the last five decades or so out of the new age industrial complex of basically just i am an educator i'm a spiritual thought leader you know and sort of going out into the world and just trying to change people's spirit and change people's perspective and awareness um i think that's over i think that's pretty much over here because as you said elena there is a critical mass now a critical mass of people who know this doesn't work and by this, I mean the entire thing, the entire growth-based model. Um, you know, I guess some people are still in that binary and, you know, they're making a shift to the other end of the political spectrum and, you know, going well. You know, the, this, like the Marxism is enjoying a, a nice resurgence lately. You know, people looking back to that. But basically, in the end, communism, socialism, it's a... It is growth based this economic system and it's the most efficient way um, to take a developing nation and turn it into a completely industrialized nation it's one of the most rapid growth models you can get um, so it's the same goddamn thing it's just almost on it can be like on steroids you know um, it's the same thing but i don't know like most people are aware that this isn't working and this, people are starting to see that it's not just capitalism, communism, socialism, socialism fascism, that there's more to it than that. Um, so I guess you've got a lot of people who shifted from the spiritual side of that and into just purely ideological battles. But that's only about 15% of the population. Um, everybody else, I think, is just quietly very aware <laughs> of where things are going, you know. And yeah, people just, they do want to shift. They want to move, you know, um, people are concerned about supply chains after the last year or so um, and that became, you know, terribly exposed. And a lot of pundits and stuff right now are talking about how much stronger the supply chains are now because they were reinforced, um, but they were reinforced by monopolies. So you have like one massive com uh, corporation that's bigger than like five uh, countries put together you know, controlling all of the supply chain and making sure that it is, you know, resilient. Um, it's so resilient, though, that when it falls, it's going to fall horrendously and take everything with it. So, you know, there is that, um, like I keep telling people with the local networks, they don't have to have a completely self-sufficient 
supply chain and local economy where they're trading. They just have to have the networks in place so that within six months of having to do so, they can move into um, you know, completely regional self-sufficiency um, as needed. You know, they just need to have it all in place. And that's not it. the infrastructure of that is an infrastructure of relationships. Exactly. It's an infrastructure of syndication and embassy and, um, you know, like that, because if you have those relations, then you have those currents moving and currencies emerge from those currents um, when they're needed. And, you know, they're not needed yet because you can still get a tin of beans at the store. Um but, you know, when you can no longer get that, you're going to want to be able to move pretty quick into, um, well, this person has 150 zucchinis they can't eat and this person yeah. has 50 pumpkins and um, figure out how that economy works. What do you reckon, Trudy? Yeah, I mean, I was going to bring this point up exactly about relationships. You know, this is like, the, the I think, the most important thing in, in the network and in the communities also that, um, that I've been with. Um, I think that... I think because there's been such a big disconnection and I think that we see that also as a manifestation in all of the, you know, the corporations and just the globalized um, world. And, you know, as humans, we need, we need to be connected to each other. We want to have these relationships, you know, and to build trust. And I think trust has also been broken. You know, if you look at historically, like in where we've come from, like my country was also colonized for like 500 years, you know, so and, and I'm a product of that, colonization and the globalized system because I'm also of mixed heritage you know so it's like the trust has been broken so we have to rebuild um, and rebuild and through that you know rebuild our relationships and economy can grow from that you know I think that's also really important to to remember that um, you know understanding and having that relationship with ourselves with each other with place we can rebuild all these things, like you're saying, Tyson, like locally, regionally, and the networks become even more important. You know, so I love this word that you're saying syndication, because it's through the networks that we can also help each other and help to spread and disseminate. Um, because otherwise we become too like kind of insular and, uh, and when we're holding on to solutions, we might be, okay, we're gonna escape from the problems and run off and make a community, but it's not, we can't do that anymore. You know, we like 50 years ago, maybe it might have been possible, like it was just like, you know, with, um, but, but now it's like, okay, if we know something works, if there is a solution, let's get it out there. And that's what I love about the, the networks. And I'm even seeing meta networks, you know, networks networking with each other so that we can just wide, um, spread it really widely. I think there's, there's no, like you're, you know, we're all talking about like, there's, it just feels like there's no time anymore. So like, how, how do we utilize what we do have? And the, the fact that we do have technology, the fact that me and James are here on our hotspotting, you know, with our phone, um, you know, in, in different places that we can share and learn from each other in this way. How do we really use our technology in a positive way that can have really great impact? Well, especially because um, it's so very temporary. <laughs> There's not going to be much of our history where we had the, the affordances of that. That's right. You know, exactly. at, at all, because, you know, those satellites are coming down. Mm -hmm. you know and these rare earth metals are rare and etc cetera, etc cetera. this won't last much longer yeah exactly. you know? but you also need to remember your old stories and and um try to keep in your mind as well a time when you had those affordances in other ways mm -hmm. you know? because yeah. there are those things yeah. you know a couple of weeks ago um so during lockdown um the network really broke down in melbourne because there was a storm so, and there, there, there was no provision made for that in the kind of emergency planning uh, of the seasonality. Like that's a, that is the storm season. And so they hadn't thought about that. They were just like, oh, everyone can work from home. No. Um, <laughs> so it couldn't Zoom. Often the phone wasn't working either, you know, etc. cetera. Um, um, my niece, 3,000 kilometres away, uh, got in lots of trouble. Um, she's a very, very vulnerable person living in dangerous situations. So always, and I always get that message of when she's in trouble and it always comes before the phone gets it to me. And um, there was no, you know, there was no looking at the social media or anything else, you know, with the phone. But I know, you know, her totem is Tin Tin, which is like a magpie lark. And anytime she's in trouble, that Tin Tin comes to me. 
and it comes really close and it sits right there and does an agitated dance and I know she's in trouble and then I know to get in touch with her, you know. And, um, yeah, there were a whole heap of people that were... Um, um, she was under siege in her house with her partner and there were a whole heap of people over the course of about a week who were trying to burn her house down with her in it. And, um, yeah... And then eventually, you know, she was locked in the house with the wrong partner too. So she ended up with a broken leg from that, you know. So I knew she was in trouble and I was able to, uh, I was able to help as soon as I could in that way. Although I was on lockdown, so I couldn't fly up there with a baseball bat and sort those bastards out. But, um, you know, next time. <laughs> I tell you, though, that story is just to let you know, there, there have always been affordances uh, for mm -hmm. communication and knowing things over long distances and understanding when changes mm. and things have happened in other places, understanding when ceremony times have shifted and things like that. So, you know, when to travel and uh, what to do. Yeah. Mm. I think the stories I think are really important, you know, like really like hearing the stories and that's, that's something I think that we've also been disconnected from, mm. like hear, listening to the stories of, of our elders, passing on that knowledge, you know, mm. like we have this like big intergenerational gap now yep. um, of separation between the younger generation and the older generation mm. so how do we rebuild that how can well, how can the youngsters like look up to their elders and hear these yeah. stories so that they it has to be intergenerational mm -hmm. and that means the youngsters now they have to be put, passing on cautionary tales to their kids and their exactly. kids kids because your descendants are exactly the same as your um, ancestors you know it's just it's all one thing so that story has to go around Mm -hmm. And I guess, um, I mean, one of the one of the things to draw from the story I just told you then, uh, that little cautionary tale is um, how important it is to make sure that men have a role and they're mm -hmm. not pariah camp dogs at the outskirts of the mm -hmm. town fighting over scraps. Because that's what I see in this movement, Helena, and in all of the green spaces and the spaces that are moving towards something good. It's always women. There's plenty of male speakers. I know that because I'm one of them. And every time I'm looking at an audience <laughs> of 95% women, yeah. you know, in that yeah. audience, yeah, you know, yeah. and it is always with grassroots movements, it's women who yeah. are actually doing the pushing. And that includes the storming of the Capitol. That was women getting shot there. And that was women stealing the laptop and Nancy Pelosi's laptop. It was women who made that happen, you know, because women are always at the grassroots and at the forefront. Um, men, we kind of follow along. You know, <laughs> we <laughs> kind of follow sure along, but that. it's very important when you get it established. It's important to make sure that you create a role um, for men, you know, Absolutely. that's not elevating and, them in a hierarchy, yeah. but yeah. also you need to make sure the men aren't at the periphery and running around because camp dogs are no good. They tend to bite <laughs> the kids a, a bit. You know, yeah. you, you got to look out for that. And I think it's make important sure that you're yeah. um, you're bringing bringing men in at that level. Yeah. I want to see it the other way around, where there's more men in the audience and, yeah. and a female speaker. Exactly. You know what I mean? But absolutely, you, it's so difficult actually because women generally prefer to speak in more human scale, connected ways. They are masters at oral communication. Mm but in that human scale situation. And mm. as you probably know, they'll talk mm. more than the men. Well, it's not and just the talking, it's the, it's the networking that we we're talking about before that's yeah. so essential. Yeah. And there's but, a through line for the story I just told you and the story I told you before about how they, how they created these missions in the first place by capturing a critical mass of women, yeah. you know, because yeah. then half the men are gonna refuse to come in and they'll just die. And yeah. then the others will come in and they'll be peripheral. Yeah and they'll be powerless yeah. and they will start doing terrible things that yeah. will keep those women yeah. um, divided enough and, yeah. and hypervigilant enough to not be effective. You I know? think it's really so it's important. very important to address yeah. that and make yeah. sure that we're together yeah. in our proper roles with each other. Yeah. Um, but Tyson, thing. Tyson, what I also want to say about that is we need to make clear that the enemy right now is white men. And I hope you agree. Those white men, should also not be demonized. And in fact, we had a panel the other day. Oh, I thought you were saying that's the actual enemy, like that they exist and all of them are irretrievably evil, yeah. <laughs> which um, I, I'd have to I disagree so. with you. No, yeah. no, no, not at all. In mm. fact, I'm defending, you know, so we literally had a panel the other day that we joked about it because it was pale male still. They were all white men. And on yep. top of it, they were American men. 
Mm. And I was saying, you know, in the broader scheme of things, they are the enemy now, as you're saying. No, no, we're, we're absolutely clear about the role mm. for us to collaborate across these divides. And we are, as you know, we're in a system now which is perhaps the most dangerous thing is the speed where we don't even have time to stop and breathe. It's scary. Mm. We are inundated on the internet with billions of voices. It's, it's a jungle and it's, mm. we're going to have to be really selective about where we look for our mm. information. Well, th- and those then are... we have also this polarization now mm. of, at every level. Uh, politics of identity, or oh, you're this and you're that race and you're this gender and you are rich, you are poor, you are white, you are not. It's really dangerous. Mm. Come together across those divides. So- well, that's because we're, we're only allowed to affect change at the cultural level right now. And the most vocal and most extreme people, which is about 15% of the population, uh, you know, have the most voices there and people tend to just go along with it. You know? yeah. So we have that. However, However, that's not where the actual power is. Power likes that going on. They like to have that going on because we think we have agency, you know, when we can change aspects of the culture or the language or bloody, you know, who's good and who's bad, whatever the narrative of good and evil is. Power doesn't give a shit about that. Power never has. Power power is systemic. Power creates caste systems. And that caste system is still in place because it is still those pale male and stale guys up there. They're putting their pronouns. They're doing everything they're supposed to do. But there's no actual change because systemically, you know, you have these individuals and you're allowed to be socially mobile as an individual. That's what our human rights framework was after the French Revolution, when they were talking about whether or not Jews could have human rights, they decided that Jews could have human rights as individuals, but not as a community. And that's where the problem is. You know, our entire conception, liberal conception of human rights is as individuals, um, not as communities. And so we're able to maintain systemically a caste system that is absolute bullshit. Not one of us is addressing that actual structural inequality. Uh, We're all looking at attitudes, beliefs, ideologies, and politics. And it's just a massive waste of time. I agree. I agree. And But I would argue that structurally, coming back to what Trudy brought up about technology and about how it's benefiting us in a certain way, we've got to be so aware that the technology is structurally centralizing power and as mm. the social dilemma spelled out, we are victims of algorithms now, even worse than men, algorithms programmed by these corporate structures. We are in a mega machine that is polarizing us. So this polarization into the politics of identity is absolutely structural. And we must look at that and we must go to the modern day to right now to see how cost has turned into a monstrous machine. So I don't know, Trudy, Trudy, I hope you agree that part of our work is to ensure that people don't depend too much on these technologies as they move forward to create the structures and the networks that we need. We need to be wary of turning everything into an app and thinking that it's the internet that's going to save us. It's the human connections. It's the real live connections to people and to nature that we need to be building. I'm sure you would agree Mm. with that. Yeah, hundred percent, Helena. Because, you know, like technology, it, it is it is good. We we can use it to for for good benefits, but it's to a limit. You know, it's like everything. How do we use things in moderation? And that's why these communities, you know, that that are on the ground, that are just like these living systems of interconnection and relationship. You know, they're not relying on technology. So when COVID did hit us last year, a lot of these communities were actually okay. They came together. People were able to grow food. They cre- They had their their, you know their own systems of governance they didn't have to rely so much on the on the extended system you know um so it they are resilient they're resilient small systems you know so how i feel like technology is 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 being given to us and like tyson's saying you know for this moment in time it can be ripped apart ripped away from us at any moment so having these hubs these these like hubs that are scattered around the planet and uh, yes we can't go back to the village living or this simple way of life we've actually come a long way from that but we do have to heal from the past there's a lot of healing that has to be done 
you know, and we can do that when we're also in place and with each, with, with each other. And I've seen this also in nomadic communities, you know, communities that are moving, that are mobile and, 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 and moving around, um, communities that are also spread apart. And like Tyson, what you're talking about, your community is all spread out, but you're still together. There's a thread that still binds you. You know, so there's this intentionality that needs to also happen right now, like knowing what we're in, knowing that we're up against a really big system that is just causing huge destruction. It's 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 designed to rip us apart. It's designed to polarize us. Yeah. And we cannot we we cannot also keep thinking and and dwelling on it. It's like we need to start moving in a different way. Like what you said, Helena, there's the fork in the road. We can go this way or we can go this way. You know, at some point in your life as an individual, we also need to choose the other way. Because like if we, if we do keep dwelling on it, it pulls us down into a very deep, dark spiral. And it's really hard to pull, pull ourselves out. So how do, how do we find that balance? Like knowing also that there is this dark side and there's the light side, you know, and coming back to that yin and yang, you know, when, and it was interesting, like I was also reflecting as you, you both were to, um, sharing, um, why did I pick China and India? Like out of all the amazing examples in Asia. And, but I was thinking there's also an importance and a relevance to that. These two big countries that are like pulling and pushing and, you know, drawing all of our communities into this big mess. But there are these hubs of hope in these countries, you know, and that's really important for us to realize. Like, yes, you know, China has been the cause of so much, like it's the manufacturing capital, like it's, but there are these amazing communities in China that are saying, no, we don't want to be a part of that. We don't want our children to grow up in these huge cities, these mega cities living in pollution and being disconnected from culture and the stories of their ancestors. We want to move away. We want to create smaller communities and, you know, come back to the elders of these abandoned villages. You know, like this is really important for us to know that there are, that this movement is happening. So and then, then they go to labor I, camps for yeah. the education. I also should let people know that we've been collaborating with the rural reconstruction movement of China, which has been trying to do exactly this, counter this, because urbanization is central to this destruction. It always has been from the enclosures and slavery. It's been driving people away from the land, away from production, diversified production for their own needs to production for the global traders. And it's always been therefore urbanizing and created unemployment from its outset. The other part is creating a situation where people are empowered to do the meaningful work that we know we need to do and that we want to do, to care for our children, to care for our elderly, to grow the food, build the houses that we need. We, the consumer culture has not emanated from people, it's emanated from institutions that had become machines and that had to find ways of changing our culture. And to do that, they had to destroy self-respect. They had to tell children that if you want to be respected by your peer, you've got to have these gadgets. You've got to have the latest running shoes. You've got to have the latest. So it set humanity on this path of envy and competition in the path which is really the fundamental human need. Every child wants to be loved, wants to be respected. So this corporate consumer culture intervene in that universal human need to create greed and competition. So the other part, you can see it. I've, I've seen so many projects where consciously people bring together intergenerational communities, connecting to each other, connecting to the land. It's an antidote that works against depression, addiction, mental illness. And I have to say again, Gabor Mate says that better probably than anybody else. And, and luckily it's being heard across the world. So we're coming near the end. And James, did you see some particularly good questions that we should try to answer last minute? Well, yeah, so we have a, we, we do only have a few minutes left. Um, do you know what, there, there are some questions in there, but you guys have also touched on a lot of the threads of those questions. I might just throw out one more from myself or something that's come up for me in, in something that you guys have discussed um, in the last few minutes, which just coming back to that, you all seem to be talking about the relationships. And I guess if we can think of, um, think of the, the, the corporate system and all the um, multinational businesses and 
power structures seem to be driven by wealth in terms of monetary wealth. And that's something that they can hoard and store and own and then pass on or keep to themselves. Whereas what you guys seem to be talking about is wealth in forms of relationships and trust and connection to communities and connection to each other and that being true wealth. And then when, when we do have these moments of um, crises or disconnection or whatever it may be, those are actually what are the security in that as well, whether it be through sharing produce, whether it be through sharing oral stories and history and cultural knowledge and wisdom, you know, those relationships seem to be true wealth. And I, I, I feel like I've heard that in, in each of you today. And it's, it's it, for, for me, what's come up in this thread of localization is investing in relationships is really a core tenant of it. Oh, I would say definitely yes, but I would also want to point out very strongly that it's also about a relationship to the land, to the living earth that is our mother and that provides for us. And linked to that is developing the skills that we have been robbed of through education, schooling, ensure that we were just left brained victims willing to go into the city to do nonsense work to produce for this consumer machine. So the path towards relationship is also a path towards regaining some of those skills. And I, and I, yeah, so the skills and the education part of it is important. And particularly, let's not forget that it's about the relationship to the land as well as to each other. Yeah. And you, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go through. Go ahead. I was just going to say, just in addition, um, Helena, like also just like rethinking or reconstructing what we think what, what wealth actually is, you know, like I think we, we tend to just when we think about wealth, we tend to think about money and, and power, but like actually wealth is more than that. It's those relationships, the connection to the land. It's, it's our spirit, you know, and, our, and, and even our intellectual um, wealth, like all of this is wealth. And how do we just rethink? think it and see it in a different way so that we can see ourselves like, um, yeah, we don't feel like we need to be successful in this one financial wealth of what we, what we think it is, right? And I guess um, I would just refer back to that same through line of the mission, missionary story, uh, stories that I've told today. And, um, you know, the most successful missions didn't, they didn't come in with guns, you know, at all and but they they did understand very important uh, one very important and powerful thing that allowed them to change the entire southern hemisphere and that is that you um is about those relationships a very good at relationship building and that it's important to make relation the most important relationships are outside of your sphere of influence they're outside of your echo chamber and those who are ideologically similar to you you need to go to the other you need to go to the ones that you're um opposed to and you need to make friends and you need to share stories and I think that speaks to um, the other problem that Helena um, uh, put up front and center before of uh, all the division and etc polarization you guys we're, we're right on 1020 which is right right on our time limit um, but I just want to say thank you to all three of you for your time and you know, being part of this session and really sharing your knowledge and wisdom um, with everyone on the on the webinar. I want to thank all the participants on the webinar who have taken time out of their day to listen and chime in through questions and through the chat. Um, and of course, Helena and the, the local futures team who have pulled it together and um, have really championed this, this World Localization Day and all of the all of the content around it helena did you want to before we we talk about the next session did you want to just talk quickly about the this, these sessions and where people can find them the back recordings and when they'll be up online yes uh as uh, we've been saying we've been trying to pull together a little bit of information about what's going on around the world and we worked over this last few months with our networks in 30 countries who put on events all around the world, six continents. And we have a wealth of material from those events, as well as a series of webinars this whole week, as well as some conversations, some special conversations I had with Gabor Mate, with Satish Kumar, 
with our colleague Camila Moreno, who is the expert on what's actually going on at the level of climate negotiations. She's been at every one of them for the last 11 years and very, very eye-opening, important material. So I hope you'll come to our websites, both localfutures.org, which is uh, where you can do your PhD on localization if you want to read and see films and articles about this movement from its outset. And of course, the outset for us was indigenous culture. So for us, the journey is from indigenous culture, what do we learn for the modern world? What must we learn for the modern world? What's essential for sustaining life and for our well being? And worldlocalizationday.org, worldlocalizationday, very long word, dot org, is where you will find these recent events and webinars. And along with various events in 30 countries, we had local food feasts around the world to make a special central point about the importance about changing the food system as the, as the most important and the most rewarding and the most effective way to make very significant change as very rapidly, remarkab remarkably successful this movement, despite the fact that we're working in a system that does everything it can to counter it. So I really hope you'll come and be inspired by the work that's going on around the world. As I said at the outset, there's so much more than we can even begin to count or comprehend. And that's what certainly what gives me hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. And at 10.30, so in a, in a few minutes shortly on this same Zoom link, a lot of those World Localization Day collaborators will be coming on for a global discussion as well. Correct, Helena? So people can yes, hop right. straight back on this link um, after a short break for... Yeah. We'll be starting again in six minutes with those conversations and anyone who would like to stay on is welcome. But right now we should take a bit of a, a stretch and a break. So just stay on this link if you want to join that conversation. Wonderful. Thank you and thanks so much, Tyson and Trudy. And, and to you, James, for doing this today. Thank you. Thanks, Helena. Thanks, Tyson, James. Thanks, guys. Thank you.